So today we're continuing our series through the book of Acts. So we're in a different place um, physically, but we're in the same part of the Bible. So we're continuing through the book of Acts. And uh, last week we saw that the Holy Spirit filled the early church so that they could boldly proclaim the gospel. So the Holy Spirit filled them so they could go out and proclaim the gospel. Um, we also need the Holy Spirit to fill us so we can live as brothers and sisters. So if we're going to be closer, that's our theme for the week. Um, if we're going to be closer, we need the Holy Spirit to help us do that. We can't do it on our own. Um, and so we're going to read in this section of Acts about radical generosity. The radical generosity of the early believers. But it was the direct result of them being filled by the Holy Spirit. So... I'm going to read now from Acts 4, um, starting in 32. Um, hear the word of the Lord. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. And from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them. And they brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And then it was distributed to anyone who had need. And Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, he sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So, together we read our same verse that we like to read. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray. Jesus, would you please fill us and would you unite us and then would you use us to help the world see gospel values, gospel values on display. We want to be people who are one in heart and mind, that the world might know the power of your resurrection. Amen. And so, Father in heaven, we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ and through the Spirit. Amen. All right. So I want to begin by reading the last verse from last week's sermon. Um, verse 31, because this verse is the foundation of everything else we just heard, okay? So, verse 31 says, After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke the word of God boldly, and all the believers were one in heart and mind. So, God's people should be one in heart and mind. That should be a quality of us. We should have shared goals. We should have shared values. And we should have shared resources. But God is the only one who can create that kind of radical unity. Like, where in the world do you see that kind of unity apart from God? It doesn't exist. But verse 31 gives us the reason behind this way of life that these early believers were experiencing. And there it is in verse 31. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the source of all this stuff. Now, Christian unity is shaped like a triangle. It's kind of a fun slide I made. Um, let me see if I can explain it. So, human beings are reconciled vertically through Jesus, right? Through the resurrected Jesus, we are raised up to eternal life through him and united to God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. And then the Father and Son send the Holy Spirit down to us to teach us and to guide us and to fill us. Okay? So we're connected vertically to God, but the triangle's then completed because then we're also connected horizontally to each other. So this passage is all about the horizontal unity. It's about the generosity that flows when people are connected on that horizontal level, deeply unified. But 
Don't forget the source of the unity. That's what I want you to see. Jesus Christ is the one who united us already in his blood. We don't have to unite ourselves. We are united in Christ. He's the head of the church, and we are his body. But sometimes we forget these things. Sometimes Christians will try to live independently from each other. Sometimes we ignore the fact that we're part of the body. And that's especially a problem in this country. The United States is the most individualistic culture on Earth. If they've done rankings of cultures from being individualistic to being more collectivist or com community oriented. And there's countries that rank like seven, eight, nine on the individualistic scale. The United States is like 97, from zero to 100. We're the most individualistic. This country praises self-sufficiency. This country encourages people to succeed without help from anybody. We say that's a, that's a good thing. You did it all by yourself. I didn't need anybody's help. Right? But Luke is describing a very different way of living in the book of Acts. And it's a uniquely Christian way of life. And it's possible because people who understand the radical generosity of God through Christ should then therefore be radically generous toward each other. So if you understand how radically generous God has been, it should make us more generous to each other. So let's look at verse 33 and 34a. You know what I mean when I do a and b? a is just like the first part of 34. Um, verse 33, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons among them. So there's a cause and effect. Cause and effect. Well, one thing happens, and there's another thing that's the result. Do you see the two of them? The apostles were teaching the people more and more. They were new believers. These were people who were just learning more about Jesus and understanding the Old Testament. The apostles were teaching them. And then as the believers grew in their understanding of the gospel, God's grace was just pouring into their hearts. And that grace poured so powerfully so abundantly into their hearts that then it flowed out. So God's grace is pouring in, and then it's pouring out. But it was God's grace that was the cause. It was so powerful that there were no needy person among them. And that's the effect. So I'm making this point over and over maybe because I don't want you to think these people were just uniquely generous. Like, oh yeah, they were they were just a really special community, just at that time in that place. But all human beings, we are naturally self-centered. Right? Who do you think about most? Me, right? Is there anybody in the world you think about more? I mean, I love you, sweetheart. I adore you. I think about you a lot. I think about myself a lot more. We all do. You know, we how am I doing? How am I feeling? Am I tired? I need some caffeine. I gotta go to the bathroom. My shoulder itches. Like we're just thinking about ourselves all the time. We're naturally self-centered, self-focused. But God's grace united these believers so much that He says they had one heart. They had one mind. One heart. One mind. And then that spiritual unity was the source of the material unity that this passage is about. Now, Acts 2 has a very similar passage. Luke reports this in Acts 2. Um, he says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking of bread. They, they'd have communion and meals together, like we're doing, and to prayer. Pray together like we're doing. And all the believers were together. 
and had everything in common. So I put on the slide there that this Greek word for fellowship that Luke uses is koinonia. Koinonia. And then the word he uses for common is koinos. So he used related words that in English, fellowship and common look very different. Right? But in the Greek, you hear koinonia and koinos. My point is, Luke used these related words because he wanted us to see that they shared life and they shared stuff. They shared their lives and they shared their belongings. They, the two were connected. They had deep relationships that led to deep sharing. Like, they really believed they were a family. They really felt like we were family. And when a brother or sister in the church was struggling financially, someone helped. They, they, they sold property if they needed to to help them. And then they would bring the money to the apostles, and then the apostles would distribute the need, the, the money, to whoever needed it. Now, important question that comes up anytime somebody reads this. Are we supposed to do this today? Or was this just for 2,000 years here? Are we supposed to do this? Um, if you're struggling with rent, right? If Jose and Jair are struggling to pay their rent, should Tom and Jane sell their house so that they can help? And Jair is shaking her head no. <laughs> right? so, so this is a good time. But I want to explain an important uh, biblical interpretation principle. Okay, Something about biblical interpretation. When you read historical accounts in the Bible, so when you read history, a good question to ask is, is this descriptive or prescriptive? Let me explain what I mean. Does it describe something or does it prescribe? Like a doctor prescribes medicine, is it telling you what to do? So did this passage, is it just describing what happened 2,000 years ago? Or does it prescribe, does it direct us to follow this pattern in every generation? And I want to give you an example. In the book of Acts, we read that the church often met in their homes, right? If you've read the book of Acts, you see over and over, they met in Ferial's home, and they met in Paul's home, and then they met in Janet Gould's home. They met in homes. And maybe you've heard some people today say something like this. They say, in the book of Acts, we see that the church met in homes. Therefore, today, all churches should be in homes. We don't need church buildings. Home churches are more biblical because that's what they did in Acts. Right? Have you ever heard someone make that argument for house churches? Okay. I think it's a mistake to say that. Because what you're doing is you're taking a description and making it a prescription. You're reading history and saying, we have to do that. And there's nothing wrong with home churches. Not, not, not saying home churches are bad. Some of you have told me about your home country where Christians are persecuted, right? And a home church was the only place you could safely worship, right? It was the only place that Christians could worship safely. And so, Persecution is one of the reasons why house churches happened in the book of Acts. Another reason they met in homes was because the church was just getting started. So they just met in the place that made the most sense. But I think it's a mistake to read the descriptions of house churches in Acts and say, that's what we have to do for all time. Okay? Now how can I be sure? How can I be confident I'm interpreting it right this is your Bible reading tip for the today. If you're unsure in your Bible about one passage, you're not sure exactly what this means, look at other parts of the Bible for clarity. Because something might be unclear here, but another passage will make it clear. God's Word never says, if you look through, you'll never find a place where it says, the house church is the only way to do church. 
Paul doesn't write to Ephesus and Colossian and Macedonia and say, set up house churches only. We never find it. But it does say, you need to get together. We do read that over and over. It says, Christians need to gather for worship. So God's word prescribes gathering for worship. But it does not prescribe homes as the only location of the word. Hope I'm not over making this point. But I want you to see God's word commands radical generosity. But it doesn't just tell us exactly how we have to do it, right? Because in our selfishness, we might think, oh, this sharing in the book of Acts, <coughs> it doesn't apply today. The world has changed. Things are different. And I agree, like the world has changed. We don't need to literally sell our homes and bring piles of cash to put at the elders' feet. But we don't have to follow that pattern. We can write checks, we give online, a lot has changed. But God has not changed his expectations of generosity. That's what I want to try to unpack. Here's an example, go to another part of the Bible. If we go to 1 Timothy, we can read this. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. And command them, the rich, to be good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. And in this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So here, written years later by Paul, he wrote to Timothy, and we see the same pattern that we saw before, right? God richly provides us with everything. Therefore, we should be generous and willing to share. Um, and I had an illustration that I required a pack of gum, and I forgot to put it in my pocket, so I'm just going to walk over here. Oh, look at that. Is that a whole pack? Yeah, yeah close enough. Right. All right, it's in your hand, man, now, so you hold it. How many sticks? How many sticks are in that pack of gum, man? I mean, there, just what it says on the pack, right? Yeah. 15. Okay, so, now. But there's less than 15. Sure, but it's a pack of 15 gum, right, that I just gave to man. Now, Ginger asks for a stick of gum, man. Are you going to share? Right? Of, of course you're going to share. Because, this is a silly thing, but a minute ago, May, how much gum did you have a minute ago? Yeah, but a minute before that, how much did you have? None. None. Yes. So she had zero gum. Now she has 15 sticks of gum as a free gift. And so I hope you'll be generous. I was generous to give you 15. So you should be generous with others. You received. <laughs> Anissa wants a stick of gum. Yeah, yeah so does Sumio. This is the silly point I'm trying to make. There you go. Everything we have comes from God, friends. Everything you have comes from God. And so he expects you to be generous the way he has been generous. We're blessed to be a blessing. Okay, there's two obstacles to this kind of radical generosity in today's passage. Two obstacles, I think, to this. So one obstacle is selfish givers. The other obstacle is proud receivers. Selfish givers, proud receivers. So hold, hold out your hand. Hold out your hand like this, right? So if you're a selfish person, you, you grip your money. You're holding tight. A selfish person is holding tight. You won't open your hand to give it to someone else. But a proud person also has a closed hand. They have a proud receiver. A proud receiver also has a closed hand. You need help, but you're not willing to give it to receive it because you're too proud. Okay? What I'm saying is you can put your hands up. What I'm trying to say is you can be sinfully self-centered in two different ways. 
You can be sinfully self-centered because you hold your money so tight that you don't want anybody to take it. But Jane can be so sinfully self-centered that she, I'm offering her money, I'm trying to help, but she's keeping her, no, 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 I don't need that. I can figure it out myself. I don't need your help. So our sin can make us not give, and it can also make us not receive. This retreat, I think, is a good example of some of these principles I'm trying to share. Some of you have not been in the United States very long. Some of you are still getting established in your jobs and your careers. And even if you have a good job, it's expensive to live in this area. It's really expensive. So money, money is in short supply. Money is tight for many people in our church. Many people in our church, it's, it, financially it's difficult. Some of you could not be here on this retreat with your current budget. But all of you are here. Why? You're here because some brothers and sisters gave to a scholarship fund. There's one person who's not even here who gave very generously to the scholarship fund because that person understood that this retreat would bless everyone. My point is this retreat could only happen if both were willing to have open hands. If there were givers who said, I will give money for my brothers and sisters to come to the retreat. It also requires you to have the grace to receive help from others. We both have to have open hands. You have to be willing to give and willing to receive. And for those who have received help, one day you will likely have more resources and then you will help others. Because as you receive generosity, God makes you want to give others. So this is what we want to see at One Voice Fellowship, I think. The same thing that we see in verse 34a. That my next slide? No, maybe I didn't put it up there. It's all right. 34a said there were no needy persons among them. No needy persons among them. And that doesn't mean that everyone has the same house. That's not the goal at our church or in the world. It's, the goal is not that we all have the same house or the same income. The, the, this, the early church did not eliminate personal property. The Bible doesn't endorse communism. Right? Communism where everybody, nobody owns anything. It's all shared. Because we look through the Old Testament, you find private ownership. You can find personal property mentioned. So we're not talking about communism. It's, it's Acts 2 and 4 saying that people gave their money voluntarily. They gave from their heart. And that's how we give also. And if you don't know it, One Voice has a deacon's fund. We have a fund with money to help people in the congregation who need it. If you're struggling to pay your rent, if you don't have money to pay your bills or buy food, you need to talk to us. We need to know that. And we hope early next year to elect elders and deacons, and then we will have deacons who will oversee this fund. But we have money available now to meet the basic human needs of our congregation, right? If you want a bigger TV, that, that's not what the fund is for. <laughs> okay? Not to get you a bigger TV, but, it, but like if you're going to the grocery and you're not buying milk and butter because you don't have enough money for basic food, you need to talk to us. We're not gonna all have the same amount of property in the church. That's not the goal, okay? But no one should be suffering for their basic needs. And we're not gonna have the same, therefore we have to remember that money can easily divide people. I think that's one of the reasons why it's uncomfortable maybe for some of you to accept help, to come to the retreat, because it feels uncomfortable to receive. But we're gonna have different amounts of money in this church. And it can cause suspicion or jealousy 
I, I saw it happen in my previous church when, with people we were helping. Here's an example. One Voice currently has two vans that were donated to the church. So we have two minivans that were donated to the church. One of those vans is 15 years old, and the other one is 20 years old. Now, those vans we're going to give to members of the church who need them. Now, let's say that we give you the 20-year-old van. Are you going to be jealous of the person who got the 15-year van? Right? <laughs> right? Are, are you going to talk about it? Are you going to gossip with other people? Maybe you're going to think, oh, the pastor and the deacons, they, they like her more than they like us. That's why we got the old van, and she got the new van. Right? But that stuff can happen in a church family. And you know what? That's Satan's favorite TV show. <laughs> it is. When, when Christians start talking like that, Satan makes popcorn. <laughs> That's his favorite TV show. He loves to watch us gossip and talk behind each other's back. He loves it. We can defeat Satan's schemes to divide us. We can defeat him. Look at verses 34b and 35. It says, from time to time, those who owned land sold them, brought the money, and put it at the apostles' feet. And the apostles distributed the money. So why didn't the people just give the money directly to the person who needed it? One reason is they were giving it to God. They were giving their money to God. And then they trusted God to direct the money where it needed to go. And the apostles received the money and prayed. They prayed, God, who should get this money? So Satan wants to there to be suspicion and envy among the church. And we're not going to let him win. We're not going to let him make popcorn. Not here. If you get an old van as a gift from the church, I ask you to give thanks to God for his generosity in giving you a 20-year-old van with 200,000 miles and be happy for the family that got the newer van. And your brothers and sisters, be happy for them. And there's his dog, Harry. And there's his dog, Harry. <laughs> and remember this. God's leaders prayed and they thought carefully about who to give the vans to. And you can trust your leaders that God enabled to make that decision. Okay? Verse 32 says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. They were one in heart and mind. Now, we live in the D.C. metro area. There are six million people. Right? That's a lot of strangers. But the local church is designed to be a family where we know each other where we can be open and honest, even about our needs, about our sin, about how much money we make. See, if we walk in the light, we shame the devil. When we walk in the light, we shame the devil and we honor God. And so if you feel ashamed or embarrassed about receiving help, you need to ask God to take those feelings away. Because you have received God's abundant grace freely. And you should be willing to receive grace from your brothers and sisters. But I say the same thing to anyone who holds tightly to your money. Remember that you received God's abundant grace freely. And therefore you should freely give grace to your brothers and sisters. And so the, the source and the fruit of these things are related here in 33 and 34. 33 says, with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them that there were no needy persons. So there's a connection there. You see, the apostles were preaching, teaching about the resurrection of Jesus. 
The reason the church was generous was because they understood God's generosity towards them. Paul wrote this in 2 Corinthians 8. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty could become rich. What Paul's saying is that Jesus willingly left the comfort and safety of heaven. He had no needs of any kind in heaven. And he left that place to suffer and die here for our sins. That's what it means through his poverty. He gave up everything to get you. And so if you have trusted in the name of Jesus, your guilt was buried in the grave with Jesus. And then you were spiritually resurrected with him to new eternal life. And you're a child of God now. Don't forget what that means, a child of God, right? Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos are the two richest men in the world. They keep trading places, who's the richest, okay? They're billionaires. Their children will never run out of money. But your father, who is your father? He is the king of the universe. He made everything. All that exists belongs to your father. Maybe you're not financially rich, but you are spiritually rich. You will live forever up there in your Father's mansion in heaven. Let me ask you this. Is there anything you really need that your Father has not given you? We have a lot of things we don't need. Is there anything you really need that God has not given you? My own house. Your own house. But has he given you, I would, I, we will pray that God gives you your own house. Amen. But when you go back tomorrow, Will you have a roof over your head? Will there be heating and air conditioning? Will your children have beds? Is there a kitchen where you can cook meals? Yes. I could take what they have. That's right. That's my only point. I said that maybe I have my own house and yeah. it would be more space for me. Yeah. That's why I'm happy with what So you're happy. Okay, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. You're happy with what yes. you have. Yes. You don't really need your own house because it might add more stress. It's just a dream to feel I can uh, do what man. Yeah, I understand. But God has met our basic needs, and he's given us far beyond that. So why, since he's given us so much, why do we hold so tightly? Why do we think this will give us security? Friends, your security is not in your possessions. That's not where your security comes from. You are secure and you are spiritually wealthy because God is your father, he's your daddy, he's your Abba. That's where your security comes from. And so my prayer for our church is that we would understand deep, deep in our hearts that God has been radically generous with us in all these different areas. And then that will cause us to trust God with our money. Because we'll remember where this came from in the first place. It all came from Him. And so when we give our tithes and our offerings, when we give sacrificially, even if it's hard, what we're saying is, God, I trust you with my budget. I trust you with all my material needs. And then when we help each other, we're saying, God, thank you for meeting my needs and giving me a little extra, or a lot extra, so I can help my brothers and sisters. The Beckwell people of Congo have this saying. I'll close with this and then I'll pray. They say, sharing brings a full stomach, and selfishness brings hunger. So let's work to be a church where everyone has a full stomach, 
a full stomach, because we're all eager to share with each other the things that God has shared with us. Okay? Let's pray. Jesus, you taught us, you taught us that the greatest commandment is to love God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And it's to love our neighbors as ourselves. So Jesus, would you help us remember that vertical and the horizontal dimensions of love? Help us remember them both. We've received radical generosity through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now help us be radically generous with each other, with our time and our treasure, so the world might know that the gospel is real, the gospel is true, and it offers help and hope for anyone. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.